Welcome to Suzanne's studio. I'm Suzanne Barnett, your host, and tonight I am honored to present my distinguished guest, Dr. William Miller, who has had more than an extraordinary life, and you're going to hear some of it. It would take 25 shows, believe me, to cover Dr. Miller. Anyway, an example of one of the things Dr. Miller was in 1971 to 1979, he was vice president and provost at Stanford University. I could go on and on. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm so glad you're here. May I call you Bill? Well, yes, indeed. Okay. Everybody calls me Bill. Okay. Sort of like Bill Clinton, you know. They call him Bill. <laughs> yeah. Boy, there's so many Bills. That, yeah. and that's a, my brother's name is Bill. That must well, be. You're William, it easier, of course. Right. Well, Suzanne, thank you for inviting me to your studio. You've done a lump, number of really great programs for uh, several years now. And I want to thank the studio people also for putting this on because I think these educational programs are really valuable to the community, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Well, thank you. You're very, you're very modest. Uh, let's talk about the fact that uh, even though you're retired and you're a professor, of course, emeritus at Stanford, and you taught from, what did you teach exactly? Ah, uh, well, I don't know how much time we have. I know, I know. <laughs> well, I taught in physics and, and computer science and business and international studies. Is okay. that all? Well, that was enough, yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. They're, they're I know. both broad, you know. In business, you can teach a lot of different things, and in international studies, they're pretty broad. So, yes, I roamed around having a good time. Okay, we're going to talk about Africa, right, tonight? Yes, that's, that's good. Now, the thing is, Bill, how... How do you do? I mean, you're you're still a young stud, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, you can't say you're old. We're not old anymore. Well, but it's cool to be old. It's actually cool to be old these it's days. It's cool? Yeah, sure. Tell what someone asked you that you just told me about something. Oh. Yeah, you remember. Uh, oh, well, they asked me uh, uh, what I... Uh, you know, my attitude toward life and yeah. so forth. And, and uh, one thing they asked me is, how do you plan your career? I never planned a career, I just discovered it. And discovery and exploration and adventure, I think, has always been a part of my life. And that, that sounds like that really spurred you on. That keeps me going, yes. <laughs> I'm gonna be 89 tomorrow. No way, <laughs> yes. and proud of it. So with, with all this extraordinary things that you've done, uh, what has led you to Africa? Well, I've been very interested in, in Africa. As you point out, I've been in many other places. I, I think I have more Chinese visas in my passport than any other country. But I've been to Africa 30 times, and I'm very interested in the people and the evolution. And Africa is in change. The uh, thing that's transforming Africa right now is really the mobile phone and because uh, people can use it for all sorts of commerce. They don't just use it for gossip, but they do that too. Uh, but it's permitting farmers who are not literate but can speak to be able to uh, find markets and so forth. So it is transforming and Africa as a whole country has about the same number of cell phones as China did five years ago. Is that and so right? that, it's, it's changing. And the cell phone technology is very good, much better than the internet. The internet's not very strong around Africa, but the cell phone technology is very good. And I have uh, been in a situation where I was watching wildlife and then I would see a tower somewhere and I could get my emails at the same time. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> But I'm interested in uh, the development of Africa, and I would suppose it's correct to say that uh, my initial interest came from wildlife. Uh, I, I, even before going to Africa, I did wildlife conservation. I worked with wolves in Minnesota before I started working with wildlife in, in Africa. 
But uh, that, I did the photography and then I did, uh, worked with specific projects. And, but then I began to learn about the people and I, I'll talk a little bit later, if I may, about meeting a, a, a group of uh, the Sambru people and then about lifting Africans out of poverty. So all of those things are part of the mix of activities that I'm interested in. But isn't that interesting because you started out with, with teaching and you, you're really in this, practically on the same path yeah. with, with Africa. So I call that being a humanitarian. Well, I think there is a basic it, it, element there of wanting yeah. to help people and That's teach it. people. And I've had some very touching moments in some of that, which we can talk about later. But I, I, it is true that I, uh, the wildlife was the first attraction. And I think for many people on their first one or two visits to Africa, that's what catches them because it's such abundant wildlife and you see it in such natural settings. Uh, the, here in the United States, for example, in Yellowstone, we have a great setting, a great wildlife, but in Africa, it's much more extensive, much more uh, uh, voluminous. Uh, and there are dangers, the wildlife is in danger. And I could mention uh, one project I have worked with as a cheetah conservation fund in Namibia. Uh, that's to preserve cheetahs in the wild. Now I was introduced to them by Charlie Knowles, who is the founder of the Wildlife Conservation Network, which is here in Los Altos, but now has moved the headquarters to San Francisco. And the Cheetah Conservation Fund has four major programs. They, they have a scientific research program. They have a big educational program, educating the children and farmers and so forth, how to live in wildlife. Uh, they have a relocation program. And then they have this fabulous guard dog program where they breed and raise a dog called the Anatolian Shepherd. It's big, it's a 110 pound dog. And they bond it to the livestock at a very early age and they chase away the cheetahs. And the oh. cheetahs, uh, the farmers say, oh, we don't have to shoot cheetahs anymore. Oh, wow. You know something we're going to show as, as we're talking, your some of your pictures. Oh, well. Yeah, that would be great. Well, they cover a lot of different things. I know, but that's okay. <laughs> we, we don't have to talk about the picture. We'll just let it run through because you have so much to say. So tell more. Well, they, uh, so I started with the Cheetah Conservation Fund and I, I helped them. I first visited them in Namibia in 1997 and they were in a rickety old farmhouse and so forth. And I spoke with the executive director, uh, Lori Marker, who's quite famous as a uh, protector of cheetahs. She's on National Geographic and Smithsonian a lot. And, and she's quite famous for that. But uh, she had a, a image of what she wanted to do. And she asked me how to raise money. And I said, you should have a business plan. So I helped her write her first business plan. Uh, and uh, she uh, she did that and she executed on that and it's a major project now. They work uh, all over the world. Uh, they're in negotiation with India to reintroduce cheetahs into India. Wow. And, and uh, so it's, it's a very dynamic project. And then a newer one started in Botswana, uh, slightly different uh, circumstance, also using dogs but a more domestic a local dog, a more indigenous dog, and that seems to be working. Although it's newer, we don't see the full effect of that yet. So you have uh, quite an influence, it sounds like, with the organization. Well, they, uh, yeah, I, I think they. You're uh, so modest. That I have to <laughs> pull it out of you. Come on, well, girl. I think they appreciate my help, uh, not just the financial help, but I think they. Appreciate advice that I've been able to give them, and, uh, and and several of the projects, even projects I haven't given much financial help to, I've helped advise them on various things and uh, fundraising and uh, publicity and how to catch the public's attention, uh, those kind of things, and I think that's worked out uh, well. So, what's the, tell about the people now? Well. Uh, in our last visit, uh, maybe I should first say a little bit about what motivated the last visit. Uh, okay. uh, that was, uh, uh, we had two things in mind. 
One, we were uh, visiting with this organization called Kickstart. Kickstart has raised 700,000 people out of poverty in Africa. And they, it's a, mar a marvelous program. What they do, they make small technologies for rural farmers. Their famous one are the water pumps. So they have a couple models, or about three models of that. And they permit small farmers to irrigate and have more crops uh, and better crops. And they have lifted these people out of poverty just because they can make these small plots of two acres productive. And we visited one in this in March where there was this young woman who literally jumped her family out of poverty in less than a year. Is because of, of that? Yeah, she could irrigate. Yeah. She raised more. Her 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 money crop, she raised several things. She raised beans, maize, but her money crop was kale. And she could turn a a uh, crop of kale in 45 days with irrigation. And then she'd have it rotated so there are three crops. Every 15 days she had a new crop. And uh, she was on the phone uh, <laughs> calling the markets, how many bundles do you want and so forth. Just catapulted out of poverty in a year. How did she learn to do that? Now, Kickstart does train them about rotational farming and things like that. They. They do not give away these pumps. They have to save money to buy the pump because then they have value, they value it. If they just give it away, they may not repair it and so forth. So they have to earn, earn it and uh, they sell the pumps at a very low price so people can do that. And it's just a marvelous program. We visited them, went to three different farms to see what was going on. That was my second visit with Kickstart in, in Africa. I did one in 2007 and did this one this year. That's one of the things we went for. The other, we wanted to visit our friends uh, who uh, are looking after elephants. And uh, Ian Douglas Hamilton is one of the great heroes of elephant uh, uh, preservation. Uh, he has an organization called Save the Elephants. It's up in Samburu, part of Kenya. Uh, we wanted to visit him, and we visited, we stayed at a place called Elephant Watch Camp. Uh, it's run by his daughter, who is herself a famous person. She uh, does a lot of TV. Those people who are interested in, uh, uh, you know, the animal stuff may have seen on Animal Planet a few years ago a program called Big Cat Diary, and she was one of the moderators on that. That's a lovely lady. She runs the camp uh, in, uh, and it's in uh, near the Samburu district. Uh, we visited the Save the Elephants and we had a great time at the camp and they employ these people, the Samburu people. The district is called Samburu district. The uh, indigenous people there are Samburu. The Samburu uh, are cousins of the Maasai. We see more pictures of the Maasai, yeah. but the Samburu dress like them. They have uh, uh, about 90% of their language is the same. They can speak to each other and so forth. They're a pastoral people. Uh, Bill, where is Samburu located exactly It's in north. Africa? Uh, uh, good question. It's north of uh, Nairobi. It's in the no more or less the northwest are getting towards Somalia <laughs> and Ethiopia. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I'd say it's a, about an hour's flight by plane, a, little, a light plane. And, and it's a, a dry country. They have a lot of elephants in the area. They have a lot of other animals. These Samburus also work in these camps. So they have a very strong economic interest in stability. And the Samburu warriors can be fierce. <laughs> they, you see them in their native dress and they're holding spears, but in their hut they have an AK-47. And so the Somalis who have created, have created most of the terrorism in, in, in uh, Kenya do not mess with the Samburu warriors. <laughs> but what about you? I mean, are you safe when oh, yeah. you go on these trips? Yeah. Okay. We got our Samburu warriors with us. <laughs> oh, you do? Okay, okay. Have you ever had a close call? No, I've never really had really? a close call. I've uh, 
there are times when you see animals that look threatening and you know, you can read their body language. I mean, they communicate them <laughs> their irritation and you just don't press them when they're irritated. Yeah. <clears throat> How many times have you been to Africa? Well, the, the March trip was my 30th trip. Ah, and, and, uh, and you I, know what? I was just thinking something. You better stay alive for a <laughs> long time. What would, what would the world do without you? Well, I got to do a few on. more trips. Well, one of the other yeah. uh, wonderful animal experiences was uh, the gorillas. And I went to see the gorillas in 1988 on the Rwanda side of the Virungi Mountains. And then the same mountains separate Rwanda and Uganda. And later in the 90s, I forgot what year, went to see the gorillas on the uh, Rwanda, U Uganda side. It was um, it's a very touching experience because these you see the little ones running around like little teenagers and stuff, and they're, the silverback is lying down there bouncing on his back and so forth. <laughs> so does the, does the dad st uh, stay close to the family? Yes, yes. Oh, he does. Yes. When we first visited, uh, several times when we visited, uh, uh, you, you're very submissive. I mean, you, you don't uh, act like you're threatening and you kind of keep your head down. And uh, the silverback would uh, come over and sit beside on a tree and just kind of watch you and so forth. But protecting the family. But yeah, he was there yeah. to protect the family, but... but uh, I, almost as though he was enjoying or enjoying his family. <laughs> well, they're, what is their intelligence? The well, gorilla? they're very high on the intelligence factor. Yeah. They, yeah. Uh, the chimpanzee and the bonobo, which is a, a relative, it looks like chimpanzee, they have the highest intelligence, but the uh, gorillas are very high on the scale. They are too. Yes. Yeah. So they're monogamous. Uh, well, no, they all have several females in their, in their group. Really? Yes. yes uh, so they're not. No, they gather together. <laughs> <laughs> Two females. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, uh, so, um, well, but back to the people. You yes, ask yeah. about the people. And I, meeting the Sambru was really educational. We, um, uh, as I say, the Sambru live in that district. Uh, we learn from our guide who was Sambu, and he had a, a driver assistant who was learning to be uh, a, another, a guide, and uh, both of them, a man and a woman, and they talked very freely about the religion, about the relationship of the elders and the customs. Uh, a Sambu boy becomes a warrior. A, they're, they're circumcised around late, around 17 or 18 years old. Then they become a warrior. And they're a warrior up until they're ready to marry, up until their 30s. Uh, the warriors <laughs> uh, do cattle raiding. Uh, that's, uh, they raid other uh, tribes for their cattle. There's not as much of that as there used to be, but it still, still, it's still happens. There. And they sp uh, obviously speak English? They speak, these people that we spoke with spoke yeah. very good English. And uh, that's, uh, a feature that is so touching and important. They're very interested in education. This, um, uh, a man who is the executive director of the Lion Project in the area was telling us a few days ago that uh, uh, they tried to organize these Sambu Awards to help them where, tell them where the, life, where the animals were because they know everything out there in the mm -hmm. field. And then they would want to give them something in return. They asked them what they want. They said education. They wanted to be educated. So we visited a, um, a, a school, a San Bruno school. It was, uh, had preschool through eighth grades. In uh, Kenya, the, uh, the, through the eighth grade, uh, education is free. Although the children have to buy uniforms, they have to buy supplies, but there's no tuition. Uh, high school, you have to pay a tuition, so high school becomes a big obstacle for them. But this school was so interesting. Uh, we had to visit every classroom, of course. They all had to see us and everything. <clears throat> but in the, uh, there are a couple touching moments there. In the uh, preschool, there's an older lady 
uh, studying away, and the teacher told us that she was a, a helper. She worked uh, a housekeeper in the girls' dormitory but she had never learned to read and write, and she is now determined she is oh. going to learn to read and write. And oh. so she was studying away. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. But how do they get those people that are so poor, how do they get enough money just to get their children's uh, uniforms? Yes, uh, that is sometimes a problem. Yeah. And often in a family, uh, only one will get to go to school because they can't afford the second one. Uh, but they. The emphasis is so strong, uh, there, there are some scholarships to help them, uh, but it, it's very difficult. And one of the things that we did, my friend and I did, or, uh, she organized through the Rotary Club in Palo Alto uh, to send books to them and oh. so, uh, uh, in, in English. They, in school, they teach Swahili and English, and they talk a, in Sembru or also the native language, but they, the teaching is either English or Swahili, mostly English. That's the universal language yes, right, of the yes. world, right? Yeah. The other touching moment was <laughs> in one of the classrooms, there was a chalkboard, and written on the chalkboard it said, do not disappoint your mother. <laughs> I thought that was very neat. Very much so. Yeah. They're like the Jewish mothers and the Asian mothers, right? <laughs> yeah, and the but two Samburu it, mothers. <laughs> but in your opinion, do you think the number one thing is education? Yes. Period. I, End of story. I, I believe that. Be that. Well, I, I, there are two things. Okay. And education is a part of it. Lifting people out of poverty, I think, is the most important thing you can do because education will follow. Yes. That's a, such a high ambition yes. that if they lift out of poverty, education will follow. Uh, I think you can lift more people out of poverty more quickly than you can with education. So it's a longer term process. But poverty alleviation is so important because in, in West Africa where they're having all the problem of Ebola and so forth, it's a cesspool of disease, partly because people eat jungle meat uh, they, uh, that transform the disease. They don't have proper health care. They don't know about health care. Once you begin to develop a middle class, they begin to think about what control they have over themselves, but also how they might interact with the go governments because uh, uh, corruption is still a big factor in, in many uh, African countries. Of course. How can we help? Well, there are, uh, people can do a lot of different things, not to put an advertisement on it, but the, things like the Kickstart program, uh, the financial support, the, because they use the financial support to spread the, their knowledge. They don't give away the pumps, but they use it to spread the knowledge, educating and so forth. Uh, the Wildlife Conservation Network is a fabulous organization. Uh, it uh, has about 28 projects in different countries around the world, a large number in Africa, but not all of them. They have them in Asia, South America. Uh, so that's a, a great organization. And they have learned that they, well, I guess they started the idea, the most important thing in wildlife conservation is also community development. And all of those programs are very active in community development. Now, the old idea in wildlife conservation that the World Wildlife Fund had for a long time, now they've changed. They used to think, oh, you've created an enclave and keep the natives out and protect the animals. That didn't work. First place, they couldn't keep the natives out. The natives were too clever yeah. about that. But also, they didn't have an interest in it. So uh, Russell Train, who started the African Wildlife Foundation, promoted this idea that you interact with the communities. And so WCN, World Life, Wildlife Conservation uh, Network, has the same thing. And all their projects, like I mentioned, the Lion Project is working with it. The Save the Elephant Project are working with the communities. Uh, they all work with the communities. So those are great organizations that people could either, um, you know, interact with. Uh, there's a 
World Wildlife Conservation, the Wildlife Conservation Network has a big expo in San Francisco every year. Uh, it's uh, late September, early October, where all the people come. And the, you can pick your favorite project to see which one you might want to wow. give support to. What do you see yourself doing, say, five years from now? Uh, to see the which... Uh, the, you. Well, what do you see yourself doing? I'm not oh, saying, myself? Yeah, you, oh, you. I, you well, I'll keep it alive. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to keep going. You've got to keep going. you got to keep going as yeah, long as I can. Yeah, with this break. Well, I think I, will, uh, I think I will still be exploring as long as I can. And you, you haven't lost it. You haven't lost your memory in any way. And your physical health is, is obviously mm, pretty all good. right. <laughs> yeah, pretty good, right? Yeah. So we just have a couple more minutes. And uh, first of all, I, I implore you to come back because you have so much to talk yeah. about. And you're so interesting. And you're very humble. You really are. Well, so, my friend and I are going to go to Myanmar to uh, Burma at the end of no, uh, December. No. And we've never, that's the only Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian country I have not visited. And uh, so I'm reading a lot about Burma now. <laughs> of course. Well, I thank you so much. And I uh, advise the audience to Google you, which is, <laughs> tell, tell what it is. You're, you're uh, it's William. Uh, no, if you just no, Google uh, William Miller, William F. Miller at Stanford, do you find me? <laughs> uh, yeah, William F. Miller at Stanford. Yeah. Bill, thank you oh, well, thank so you much. Suzanne You're for just a me. wonderful guest. Yeah. And I've really been so nervous because, you know, you're you're so extreme. Well, you don't, you don't, so you don't cause your your guest to be nervous, so that's a good oh, start. Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> no, but when I have such a uh, extraordinary guest, it's really it's such a joy. And uh, I know my audience our audience enjoyed you too, and we'll have you back. And I want to thank our crew. We couldn't do this. This is all volunteer. You know a lot about volunteering yeah. at this point. And of course, I always say this. I thank my audience, and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.